Well, uh, I was uh, from a, a Little Italy area, uh, born and raised up there, and uh, Italian descent, and uh, became a Christian, uh, even though I heard all that growing up, I never had a real relationship with Jesus. And in uh, June of 1989, I was uh, working on a masonry job. I was labor, and there was an evangelist that worked that job. And uh, he had been speaking to me for years, but this one day I had just gotten married, and I had my first thought from the Holy Spirit. I said to this evangelist, which is, uh, his name is uh, Greg Lafasia, which is an outstanding uh, evangelist. Uh, he... Uh, uh, which, you know, continued to share Christ with all of us. And then I, one day I just said, hey, I don't think you can be married today without the Lord. And he said, would you like to uh, accept the Lord? And uh, so I always tell people, I didn't get the red carpet. I didn't get the, here's a free Bible. Let's go out to lunch. I was on a job site. I knelt in the rocks. He prayed over me. As soon as I got up, I had to mix a double batch of stuff <laughs> So uh, right away I said, this is probably going to be a little bit like my story because, uh, uh, you know, like I said, you know, I've seen people re receive at the altar and uh, with Neil on corporate and, like I said, get gifts and presents and clapping. I got none of that. I got, okay, you receive Jesus now. It's time to make semen. So that, that's how I started. And that was in... Uh, 1989, yeah, June, June of 1989, and uh, so uh, I had just started my journey on learning how to be married, and uh, and the Holy Spirit entered me, and the rest is uh, going to be unveiled as we go. Well, in 2006, the Lord put an a unquenchable fire inside of me to go to the bikers with the love and compassion that he had shown me. And uh, I was associate pastor at a church at that time, and uh, I had been with the church about seven years. And uh, so I was very excited, and I, I went to the leaders, and, uh, and I, I understand it just wasn't their cup of tea. So, uh, you know, they... We, basically said, you know, this is not what we're looking for here. So, you know, God had already made the decision. <laughs> and, uh, broken and rejected, I left with no plan and no money. <laughs> and I was riding an old shovel head at the time, which is an old Harley, and uh, that would belong to my friend that was killed in a motorcycle accident in 2004. And uh, right away, the purchase of, this, of that bike, well, I had no money, and I really wanted the bike. And uh, it was made possible by uh, an, an outlaw motorcycle club that financed it for me. So God was already in work, because I haven't had to go to their clubhouse slash bar and make my payments <laughs> every Friday. And then Sunday, I was <laughs> at the pulpit. So it was a little bit comical, really. But that's where God was already working, because, you know, I... I it was financed by an outlaw motorcycle club who thought, yeah, we like to see you have that bike also. So um, where, where the church rejected me and broke me, and I think there's a lot of us out there that have been hurt and rejected by the church. And uh, uh, these guys, they accepted and, and they loved on me, and, and God was in the midst. And uh, I was riding around aimlessly, and I uh, feel the bandit, and uh, uh I noticed a truck that had been following me for several blocks. And after a few turns, I caught a light and the truck pulled up next to me and was yet another member of uh, an outlaw motorcycle club. And uh, he asked me what was going on in my life. And, uh, and I told him exactly what I just told you guys. And what he said next was essentials. Uh, I had goosebumps all over my body. I could barely ride home. Because he, after listening to my story, he looked at me and he said, and this is a, a member of an outlaw motorcycle club, you know, a, a high-ranking officer, and he said to me, you'll do more on those two wheels you would have ever done at that church. 
and I knew God had just spoke to me. You know, you just know. I, and I said the goosebumps. It could, I was like, well, I, I, you know, that's amazing that God, you know, used this man to speak these words into my life, and uh, and uh, I knew, I knew what was ahead of me, somewhat. <laughs> um, uh, I joined what we call the Christian Motorcycle Association that year, uh, and, um, and my wife and I were very effective in, in the uh, motorcycle world. Uh, the Christian Motorcycle Association is huge. It's probably 150,000 members, and they're, they're nationwide and they're, uh, international. They're all over. But uh, I became a member, and my wife and I, like I said, we, we started reaching many, restoring marriages, uh, hospital visits, weddings, and funerals, accompanied by prayer. And now it's 2015, and, and we met with a couple that rode, and they heard of our ministry, and uh, they. So we went out to dinner with them. This is the night of the accident. So uh, they told us that we need to be prayed up because of, uh, you know, how many people we were reaching. And touching, and the difference, uh, just a different, whole different uh, uh, ministry that, than than any that I had come across, because uh, we we were received grace right away from the uh, uh, the one uh, percent world, which is very closed. They're very selective about who they let near and and what, why. And uh, but they knew I was sincere, and I continued to sh show that love and compassion. Uh, so now, where was I then? Because okay, so I take notes because my mind is not as sharp as it used to be. But it was a Sunday evening, uh, November eight, two thousand fifteen, just a few miles from where Mark uh, Zaxon it was. Uh, it was uh, rut season, which that means the deer. Are, are chasing the females and, and that's how they continue on uh, uh, reproducing and things like that. So they're wild. Uh, they're just chasing now. So uh, we made the turn on the Route 9 and we had groceries in the back seat and we're talking about how we need to pray protection, how the things that that woman said to us. And I said, okay. So we stopped and we prayed and there was a, there was a, a deer already dead right there as we made the turn. And, um, uh, so we just went a little further down the road after praying protection. And this buck came right through the windshield uh, out of a ditch. I never saw him. And uh, kicking and just smashing, you know, uh, tore the car up to her, but kicked her uh, in her head. And she was immediately became blind. Uh, still had some sort of a pulse, but uh, not much. So I was dialing 911 and steering what was left of that car down to the Delaware City Firehouse. Um, uh, and then when she was in the car, I uh, saw her lift herself up to get another breath of air. And it reminded me of what Jesus did on the cross. If you remember, he had to push off to get a breath of air. And she did that exact thing and then gave up her spirit. And, you know, 30 years was over that fast. And, uh, but remember back when I said we prayed for protection, I believe that we were both protected that day. Me physically, but her differently. And I find that in Isaiah 57 1 it brought me a lot of comfort and understanding that I didn't have that the righteous perish and no one pon ponders it in his heart that devout men are taken away or women in this case and no one understands the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil so I really believe there was something coming down the road that was far worse than what we had uh, experience that day because she was took quickly. I don't believe she felt any pain. Um, and those who walk up readily and they enter into a peace and they find peace as they lie in death. So I believe she was protected one way and I was protected another, but both protected. Um, at the funeral, there was 1,500 people, 200 motorcycles. 
for some reason they alerted the the uh, authorities and they had helicopters following us and they were all over the place and uh, we really didn't get much privacy but they were all there uh, the, um, the, the law enforcement I guess it would say uh, followed us everywhere followed us down to the cemetery and but the main thing from that day is I gave the best message I ever gave in all the years of preaching which started in 2004, so it's been 20 years now. Uh, I said, I'm not angry at God. And I'm talking to 1,500 people. And I said, uh, his ways are higher than ours. So uh, did I understand? No, I didn't understand. Uh, but I, I really wasn't angry at God. Uh, did I miss her? Did I did I question him? I, all that went on, but but angry I, I wasn't because when we give our lives to Christ, we give our lives to Christ, and He we give Him the permission to do whatever He wants. It's not a tug of war, you know. Uh, it's no longer I to live, but Christ that lives in me. In Galatians two twenty, you know, and the life I live now, I live by faith. But okay, God chose to take her that day. And, and not me, and uh, I questioned that too because I was like, would have been, but we have a daughter who's still here with me, and uh, we're continuing on in the ministry. But uh, but here's what was going on. After a few years of wandering in the desert, this didn't happen overnight. I, I was wounded and hurt and looking for some type of relief in all the wrong places. And uh, so I was riding down 301 in 2018, now it's three years later, and I get hit. I'm on my bike, and I have to be helicoptered off the road. And during that time, I remembered that God had called me to the motorcycle world, and I would get, again return to my first love, which was Jesus. During that time, a young man also a biker who showed up at my doorstep going through a, a divorce. He was young. He's like a son to me and like a brother to my daughter. And I loved him like one, like a son and she loved him like a brother. And uh, so he shows up at my door and I say, yeah, you know, you gotta, you gotta stay here and your daughter can come here and you, you'll have your own thing. Don't worry about nothing. It's going to be okay. And, uh, but I knew he had a history of, incarcerations and uh, some drug abuse but he was on fire for the Lord and, and lead many and uh, I just uh, was very excited for him we would have these awesome conversations but he relapsed as often does and a lot of people will be able to uh, you know they'll understand that th this happens and sure there's people out there that have been through similar things so he relapses and I go to get him up for work. He's not waking up. He's not answering his bedroom door. I climb in the window. I find him gone. He was already cold and blue. And uh, um, so I experienced that, which led me to, uh, you know, a lot of medications and psychiatrists offices and they're just trying to figure everything out. But God continued to work in my life. I was survived by his grace and, 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 and now presently working in a ministry in what we call the 1% world, which um, uh, as far as I know, I'm the first one to ever be a chaplain to these guys uh, because, like I said, it's a very closed off, a very, uh, you know, you have to earn that trust. And uh, I continued to love on them with with the compassion and love that you know God had showed me, and, and currently working in that ministry, uh, uh, I do you know the funerals, which we lose a lot, and uh, for motorcycle accidents and such and lifestyles, and uh, but um, I'm, I'm able to move freely and all that, and uh, wear my Christian patch, which is. You know, they, they accept me just just like I am. And uh, uh, I get opportunities to share the gospel where 
uh, most would, would never even be allowed in the on the property. You know, I have free. I can come and go at the clubhouses and different things uh, that I get freedom that have never been granted before. So I know God is working in this. I know it's it's Him that working through me. Um, you know, one of the verses that uh, I, I wrote down for this interview was uh, Romans eight twenty eight, which people will quote quite often, but. And we know that in all things, God works for good of those who love him. But the second part of that, and a lot of times they stop there, is who have been called according to his purpose. His purpose. It was his purpose to take my wife home that day. It was his purpose to uh, put me in the motorcycle ministry. Uh, it was his purpose that people will be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ that would never... Uh, otherwise I had the opportunity that, that I'm aware of. Um, so um, I consider really that all our, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. But I pray earnestly, you know, God, take this pain away from me. Uh, and I'm getting emotional. Because uh, we had been, like I said, th together 30 years and faithfully just loved each other. And uh, not without trials and struggles, but, it, 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 you know, the Lord had brought us together. So when I prayed for God to take away that pain, he said, no. And I said, no, you know, that still small voice when God speaks to you, he said, it's out of that pain. And I know you guys will understand that, that these messages or birth. So now I'm not going to take it away. I'm going to use it for the further advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ and for his glory. So, uh, I'm, you know, able to comfort a lot and bring a lot of relief to others. But for me, uh, God has chosen to, to uh, not take it away, but to use it uh, in that way. And when I said what I said about I'm not angry at God, Here's, and I know you two will completely understand this. Uh, I wasn't angry at God because, not because I was this incredible man of faith. Oh, you're so strong. And I've heard all those things. The only, the, the reality of all of it is I understood and go where? Who has the words of life? Who Who is going to bring me any comfort at all? I mean, it wasn't that I was this tremendous man. It was like I understood that there was nowhere else to go but the foot of the cross. Where many others run from him, I ran to him and uh, am still running there to this day. And people came up to me at that funeral and said, well, if you're not going to be angry at God, then I'm not going to be angry at God. And love, some of them had been angry at God for their entire life, which I believe is just a deception from Satan to keep you from to surrendering your life to him and, uh, you know, walking in his ways. It was November 8, 2015. <laughs> well, <sighs> almost immediately I was led to uh, work at the funeral home uh, part-time because I have some issues from the accident, PTSD and some other things, which I believe are also a lot of people out there can relate to. Uh, but some of the things that people said was uh, they didn't understand why I wanted to work at a funeral home of all places. And uh, But I saw opportunities for what I had experienced. So, because I was meeting people that were widows for an hour, you know, a day, uh, a week. And, and I was able to share things 
that only those who are widows and lost could even know, you know? Uh, and so uh, God was using my story to help other people. Uh, Jamie's story, uh, you know, she uh, donated her kidneys and heart. and it, She was an organ donor. And I have letters here from people that received those things. So uh, I, even though people were, I guess they were literally concerned about me and my condition where I knew God had called me there and to, to touch other people's lives. Now, that was some of the things that were said that weren't helpful. Now, the ones that were was they recognized the anointing that I had with with these 1% clubs. And not only the anointing, which is awesome, they also recognized the love and compassion that I have. You know, I often say, if you haven't found something to die for, you, you haven't really lived. And these guys, I mean, I love them and with, with all my heart. And I know that didn't come from me. That compassion and love, I couldn't even muster up. It came from God himself. And, and the, uh, the people that were telling me, you're anointed, this is what you're called for, this is your ministry, that kept me going plenty of times when I wanted to give up, uh, as, as you well know, uh, Mr. Betters, about that. Um uh, so those those two things, uh, you know, people say, you know, question what I chose to do with my time, and uh, uh, others, uh, 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 you know, just reminded me that that's what I was anointed for. Now uh, I have suffered uh, somewhat uh, as far as uh, being uh, profiled um, uh, by you know, law enforcement. So they don't really understand what, what I'm, they just, you know, record the license plates and tags and come to different things. Uh, but uh, I have been shown nothing but love and affection from a world uh, that most will not enter. And uh, that, that that's most important. Yes. <laughs> Amen.
Well, I at my, at my wife's funeral, uh, we had a member of an outlaw motorcycle club to get up and, and wrote me a letter. And he shared that letter with uh, me and the 1,500 people at that um, at the funeral. And um, I'd like to share that with you because it would answer a lot of those questions. Is that okay? Uh, just take me a second. I got it right here. Okay. Okay, guys, this is what this leader of a motorcycle club got up and read in front of 1,500 people with his outlaw stuff on at the altar of the church. And this is what he wrote. I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. I recall your wife sitting alone uh, at, at establishments down here. Uh, uh, has a deck on it, and we eat out there, and we used to spend time there. At that time, I didn't know it was your wife, but she had an appearance that separated her from the others on the deck that were very noticeable. Her posture and mannerisms were classy and distinguished. After formally meeting her, she reminded me of my own mother in many ways. She spoke with confidence and conducted herself as a true lady, unlike many women today. After speaking with you both and listening to your stories from the past, it was easy to see you had been through a lot together and dependent on each other to get through the hard times. I do not know of any other words that could help you through this hard time. I get emotional reading this. I apologize for that. You're currently going through. I know most people turn to religion for answers, but personally, that has never offered us answers I am looking for. He was very honest about that. I wish I would have enjoyed her company more than that single day. But for some unknown reason, I will not have the privilege. In addition to offering my condolences, I want you to know the impact you had on my life. You are singly and handily the most positive person I've ever met. You see the good and in the bad and maintain hope that even the worst people can do good with their lives. I've never known you to pass judgment on anyone, nor thought any less of them for their views. I am consistently impressed by the way you put yourself between opposing people promoting the, the greater good. I find your giving and selfish demeanor are infectious. When I was club president, I was speaking with you, reassured me I was making good choices for myself and other guys. You taught me that through a, being a true tough guy sometimes meant making tough decisions and not necessarily using force to produce an outcome. I truly appreciate each time you have taken the time to speak with me. Uh, I have heard stories about your past and your youth and see how physically strong you are, but I feel your mind and heart are clearly your true strength. You have shown me that making a positive difference is really what people do. Lifting weights is something anyone can train to do. The way you lift people's spirits and push to make a difference and all people, especially those in the biker community, it's extraordinary to simply say you are a true brother and a great man. And if you are one of God's workers, then he is gleaming with pride for all you have done with your life and impacted the lives of others. I know you are hurting now, but, but know you are in my thoughts and, and in all our lives you have made better. Please do not hesitate to call on me or my family if anything you need. <sighs> Yes, it's 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 in a frame. <laughs> it's in a frame.
Well, that, it can only be found in Jesus. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're talking to people that don't personally have a relationship, if you're talking to a person that doesn't personally have a relationship with them, you, you just have to be that Jesus. You have to um, love unconditionally. You, you have to... Um, share what you experience but uh you have to bring jesus in a way that uh that you're an example uh that, that you know preaching to, to groups like that or quoting scriptures and all, that that's not how it's, it works you, you have to be you have to demonstrate that uh for the, in that world for them to uh realize that you do love them that you do care for them and that you do um uh and you know that you're real that you're real and uh, so you know you, you're quoting scriptures and all that and that's not how it's done you 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 have to be that jesus and maybe the only one that they'll ever meet Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, that's that's a very good description of what happens every time I re revisit, you know. But, uh, so. Yeah, I don't know how to work things. I'm I'm 67 years old, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I grew up in a time when there was one phone and it was in the kitchen, you know. And it had that thirty foot cord. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. And, and uh, Dr. Butters, thank you for being a mentor to me all these years without even knowing it. <laughs> okay.
Amen. Thank you guys.